We're going to begin with a recorded introduction from Dr. Meredith Abhu from the National Library of Wales. Of course, one of the two institutions who have been cherishing and nurturing our manuscripts on our behalf um, for, for many decades now. And we thank them graciously. And we like the fact that they are part of a huge movement to be sensitive to the complex issue around decolonising of collections. And I say that without a trace of humour or irony. The idea that colonialism can only happen across seas in pillaging, rampaging hordes, stealing other people's artefacts, it can happen at home too. And so um, I actually was told, and I won't tell you who by, that originally the Bodleian were a little anxious about the manuscripts coming here in case we kidnapped them and didn't let them go back. <laughs> That's quite an interesting point about the way we're perceived, but also, unfortunately, us rabid Cornish nationalists aren't that well organised <laughs> <laughs> um, and as yet don't quite have the capacity to pull off such a heist. <laughs> you never know if we keep... If we keep I, I, want to, I, want to, I want to reiterate our relationship with these institutions is, is superb, friendly, collaborative. Right on. <laughs> Greetings from the National Library of Wales in Aberystwyth, or the home version of the National Library of Wales at the moment. Croeso, Cynesir Llyfdellinidli, Tholach of Archion or Aberystwyth. Many of us may dream of finding a priceless and long forgotten item in our attics an item that may astonish the expert and, of course, make our fortunes. Well, occasionally, discoveries of hitherto unknown treasures, particularly of manuscripts, are made. Discoveries that do astound the experts and do delight curators and public alike. At the National Library of Wales, we frequently highlight two manuscripts in particular within our collections, both of them written in Cornish, the appearance of which have both astonished and puzzled their discoverers in equal measure. Those two manuscripts are those two volumes that are now taking a well-deserved vacation with you at Crescent Kernu. The first, Beunan's Meriasek, came to light early in the year 1864 at Penyrth, a country house in Meirionydd, northwest Wales, just up the coast from here. Now, having inherited a substantial and very important collection of manuscripts following his, the death of his neighbour and friend, the squire of Hengurt, some five years previously, the antiquary WWE Wynne of Penyarth spent the 1860s in a delightful occupation of going systematically through the shelves of his library and compiling a catalogue of his treasures. His attention was drawn to a volume of some hundred folios written on paper in a language similar to Welsh and bound in an old leather binding. Now, whether it was Wynne himself who realised the significance of this treasure, or whether it was his friend, the Reverend Robert Williams of Rhyda Croesai, author of the Lexicon Cornu Britannicum, the Cornish Dictionary published in 1865, we don't really know. But one of them identified the manuscript as being written in Cornish. It was Williams who, correspondent with the, who corresponded with the linguist Whitley Stokes, and it was Stokes who published the contents of the manuscript some eight years later in 1872 a very important milestone in Cornish language studies. The second manuscript, Beunan's K, is a much more recent discovery. 
Upon the death of Aberystwyth-based Celtic scholar J.E. Kirwin Williams in 1999, his extensive archive of papers was presented by his widow to the National Library of Wales, and there, among 20th century lecture notes, correspondence and publications, was an incomplete and unbound mid-16th century manuscript of around 20 leaves, again on paper, which was quickly identified, yet again, as not being in the Welsh language. Well, some eight years later, eight years again in this case, note, this Cornish text was published by University of Exeter Press, edited by Graham Thomas and Nicholas Williams, forming another important milestone in Cornish studies. What both manuscripts have in common is the mystery surrounding their histories prior to their discovery in Wales. There are no annotations on the leaves suggestive of use after they were written in the 16th century, either in Cornwall or in Wales. There may be a fleeting reference to Beunan's Meriasek in the earliest Hengurst library catalogue of around 1658, but even that reference is uncertain. Of Beunan's K, there is no suggestion of its existence prior to 1999. And Kirwin Williams, with all of his close contacts in the world of Celtic studies, seems never to have mentioned the presence of such a treasure on his shelves. Does this suggest that he did not own the manuscript, but was merely a short-term borrower? We may never know. It has been suggested that both of these manuscripts, being similar in terms of texts, came to Wales in tandem before then becoming separated, possibly by the mid-17th century. If so, when did that happen? Were they wrongly identified as being written in Welsh because of the similarity of our languages? And does that account for their presence here in Wales? As you can see, Beunans Meriasek and Beunans K, whose contents would have been most public in open air performance during the 15th and early 16th centuries, are shrouded in mystery. It is likely that they have been carefully preserved and treasured, perhaps in Wales, for many centuries, and they remain the most precious of the National Library of Wales's Cornish, if not wider Celtic holdings. It's a great pleasure to return them to Cornwall and to Crescent Kernew for the next three months. They will then return to their adopted home, but hey, may I remind you that their contents are always fully available in digital form on the National Library of Wales's website for all to see. A murky past they may have shared, but they are no longer concealed from public scrutiny. Uh, could we please welcome Dr. <coughs> Oliver Pallet. Do you want the clicker? Today, just to move that slide, just press that one. Well, uh, and good to have the Ochenbar, Ichi Meredith, and the Geria Keredigini. And as Benig, I'm Anton, a close Bivai Arbenic Atomni, Ma and Herniu. In the exhibition upstairs, we've got together, presumably for the first time ever in their lives, all the major dramatic works that survive from Cornwall, and four of the six sizeable Cornish language texts of any kind. So effectively, two thirds of the remains of the language. Two of the four play texts are biblical. They followed English models and patterns, although with distinctive local features, including the language itself. I'm afraid the very often quoted date of around 1375, quoted by many people, um, sometimes claimed for the ordinalia, um, is uh, wrong. 
Uh, that, that false claim arises from unquestioning repetition of the date uh, about seven, 1375 that was suggested uh, 60 years ago by David Fowler for the composition of the Ordinalia. It was based on a misunderstanding and a misuse of the place name evidence appearing within the Ordinalia. So around 1400 is a better and appropriately vaguer date for the Ordinalia. So certainly no earlier than biblical plays elsewhere in England and very probably later. But the two saints plays represented the, by the two manuscripts so kindly lent from Aberystwyth are something unique within England. It's true that there are a few other English saints plays, of, uh, saints plays but they are both few and very different in kind. They are short and most importantly they tell the story of international saints. These two are each concerned with a local saint, each of them having only a single church dedication within the county. So there can be no doubt about the place for which each play was written. St Kay's play for Key Parish and St Mariazek's play for Camborne. These plays were no doubt a new development which occurred during the 15th century um, and they were written under the continuing influence from Brittany which uh, by that period was uh, helping to keep Cornish alive in the western half of the county. In the case of these plays, we'll see reason to think that the influence came through Glasney College at Penryn. There are two medieval Breton plays telling the story of local saints, and a third about an international one, St Barbara. These Breton plays were in turn written under French cultural influence where more than a hundred saints' plays survive, some from as early as the 12th century. So our two Cornish plays represent a distinctive overseas extension of that European cultural development. I'll talk first about points that the two plays have in common, then about some differences, then a little about the evidence that the two plays are interrelated. Uh, the author of one play knew the other one. Then a little about the manuscripts themselves that can be seen upstairs. And finally, some evidence suggesting Welsh influence in one of them. Both plays are based on Latin texts which are known to have been circulating in Brittany. Both of those texts are now lost, but they survive in later summaries also made in Brittany. St Mariazek was honoured at several churches there and was believed to have been an early bishop of Van Diocese. St Kay also has several churches in Brittany and his lost life survives in a 17th century summary in French. However, that French summary contains a few English details. So the Breton Latin life may itself have been based on one written in Cornwall, if so, presumably at Glasney College. The college owned St Kay's parish outside Truro so it had reason to be interested in the saint. The link between the college and St Mariazek's parish of Camborne is less direct but still close. It's unlikely to be coincidence, as Michel has pointed out earlier, that John Nance became rector of Camborne parish in 1501, having been the provost in charge of Glasney College until then. And the manuscript of Bunin's Mariazek was written only three years later. The two play texts are linked to one another, as we'll see, and the link is explained through the different associations of each parish with Glasney. That needn't mean that the plays were actually written at the college. They could have been written in their respective parishes, but the college will have provided the intellectual milieu and the library resources that were needed for their creation. Both plays are not simple stories of the saint's life. In both, that story is interwoven with additional material, but of very different kinds. And in both, the local playwright has included events to explain features known in the saint's Cornish parish and his dedication of the church there. Episodes comparable with the place names local to Penryn in the Ordinalia, which gave even the biblical story an immediacy and a relevance for the local audience. And in both plays, the saint is given an opponent in Cornwall, the wicked and entirely legendary pagan king Tudor. 
Both plays locate this king's residence at Goodern in Key Parish. Whether that choice of location is due to the primacy of St Kay's legend is unknown. Tudor had appeared in the same role in much earlier saints' lives written in Latin of other Cornish saints from the 12th century onwards, long, long before there was any hint of a Tudor dynasty um, on the throne. But in those earlier lives, he wasn't based at Goodern. So this seems to be an attribute added in the plays. The language of both plays is similar as one would expect, but with interesting differences too. <clears throat> the probable closeness in date when the two plays were written is obviously responsible for similarities in their language. And the different history of the two texts and of their manuscripts is partly responsible for some of the differences of language, but not entirely. Similarly, with their meter, as Ben Bruch has shown, the very diff interesting metrical usages of all the Cornish texts reflect the dual nature of our heritage here in Cornwall, partly Britonic and partly English, since the lines are of Britonic type with a strict syllable count and rhymes which ignore word stress. But the lines are arranged in stanzas that are thoroughly English in type and were evidently borrowed from the medieval English plays. Another reason for being sure that the Cornish dramas are not older than other English ones. And in fact, if you remember the slide that Michel showed of the layout on the page of the End Town cycle from East Anglia, it's very similar indeed to the layout that you can see of all the Cornish plays in the exhibition upstairs. So the, uh, they were scribes, the, the, the authors of these plays were not only um, basing their work partly on English as well as on Breton and French dramas, but even the layout on the page was uh, culturally, as it were, shared as well um, with um, places elsewhere in England. The stanza shapes of the text in both Bunant's K and Bunant's Meriasek are more complex, more developed than those of the Ordinalia and Creation, closely following more complex English patterns which had evolved. But there are also differences here, too, between the two saints' plays. Before going on to those, um, I thought it would be um, worth having a quick look at Goodern itself, where both plays locate Tudor's resi residence. It was already named, uh, the farm of Goodern is at the top of the screen, um, the, the farm there. The, from the bottom is Carine, the cold fort. And I assume that refers to the round uh, fortified Iron Age, Iron Age farmstead, which lies halfway between Carine Farm and Goodern Farm, Farm at the top. <clears throat> and um, so Goodern was already named as a manor in Doomsday Book, 1086. But more important for our purposes is the round or fort um, uh, uh, near the farmstead. And just southeast of it, so just below it on the left in our picture, is um, a tumulus as well. <clears throat> and um, so there's the curving uh, hedge of the round itself in a rather old photograph. It's um, about 40 years since I've been there. Um, um, and there is the tumulus just outside the round as well. It will have been these archaeological features which the author of the play was ascribing to Tudor as his royal residence. Indeed, I find them very suggestive myself, thinking of sites in Wales and Ireland where there may be a tumulus right, si right beside a legend legendary fortified royal residence. Although it should be said that this round at Goodern is one of hundreds of such farmsteads, so there's nothing inherently royal looking about it, except possibly for its location close to one of the 340 doomsday manors in the county. Now to differences between the two plays. First, the structural ones, and most prominent of those are the additions that aren't telling the story of the saint. In Bunan's K, they tell the story of King Arthur, making it, as far as I know, as uh, Michelle said earlier, the only dramatic treatment of that international story in any medieval European language. But that's as far as the originality goes. For the Arthurian story that it tells is entirely derivative, mainly from Geoffrey of Monmouth's History of the Kings of Britain, written in the 1130s, in Latin, at Oxford. Whoever wrote Bunan's K had a copy of Geoffrey's history in front of him as he wrote, for he not only quoted directly from it at one point, 
but also he used exactly the names of dignitaries, mostly in exactly the order in which Geoffrey himself had deployed them, for the lists of kings and potentates and their realms, kings uh, who had came to help both King Arthur and also the Emperor Lucius in Rome, who had to defend his empire against Arthur's attack. I have to say that I don't think this use of Geoffrey of Monmouth did the play any good at all as a literary work. <laughs> Eunice Meriazek, on the other hand, used a story about the fourth century Pope Sylvester and his part in converting the Roman Emperor Constantine to Christianity, and thus <coughs> the whole Roman Empire in adopting Christianity as its official religion. Also in Bunitz Meriazek, um, an additional uh, digression appears, which is a charming literary folk tale, typically with unnamed characters, about a woman saving her threatened son by stealing an image of the baby Jesus from a statue of the Virgin Mary and demanding Mary's intercession for her son as the price of returning the statue. So Meriazek is structurally more episodic than Bunitz K, but it's also thematically coherent, as Brian Murdoch has well shown. Um, as far as we can tell, um, Bunitz K was more unified and linear in its plot, despite having these, this Arthurian section. But since that play is incomplete, um, the, all we can say is that the fragments we have indicate a more unified and linear storyline. Certainly the 17th century French summary seems to show that. Metrically, the main difference between the two plays is that Bunin's K borrowed more complex English transdaic structures and used them more extensively than Bunin's Meriazek did. There's also another difference, um, as Ben Bruch has also shown, uh, which is the liking of the author of Bunin's K for polysyllabic rhymes, using many more of them, um, and probably another uh, feature um, um, adopted from English. In the language, the most striking feature in Bunitz K is the amount of tedious repetition, with one dignitary after another coming on stage to announce his allegiance to either Arthur or Lucius. The probably earlier date of Bunitz K has one or two possible reflections in the grammar. Notably, the greater use of the passive voice made by the uh, native verbal ending um, with ear, as in uh, gwelir, um, is seen, for example. That formation was dying out during the period when the plays were being written, the 200 year period, and was being replaced by the analytic passive voice modeled upon English. The native R type passive is much less common in Bunitz Meriazek than in the Ordinalia of 100 years earlier, but its frequency in Bunitz K is similar to that of the biblical plays. The greater use of it in Bunitz K is exaggerated by its appearance in some of the repeated passages um, and could also be an aspect of the Welsh-type usages in Bunin's K, since it wasn't dying out in Welsh, and indeed um, <coughs> survives there to this, this day. The use of minus as an auxiliary verb to create a future tense um, is another um, feature. That, that's uh, another English feature of the language, and it's another difference between the two plays. That usage was increasing during the period when all our plays were being written. And again, Bunin's K is more similar to the Ordinalia, um, having a lower level of that usage, whereas Bunin's Meriazek uses the construction more frequently, as does the creation play of a hundred years later. But for all its earlier language, the manuscript of Bunin's K is later than that of Bunin's Meriazek, being a later copy of a lost original, as we heard earlier. And some of its spellings have been updated, making its phonology um, and especially uh, often look considerably later than that of Bunin's Meriazek, a useful reminder that in all of these manuscripts we never know exactly the status of what we're looking at in their texts and how many earlier stages the text that we actually have may have passed through. Two other differences have to do with performance. Bunin's Meriazek has interesting and quite detailed stage directions, including guns, and written in either English or Latin. Bunin's K is unique in apparently having some of its stage directions written in Cornish, instead of one or another of our other languages, like all the other plays. And these stage directions, pitifully few though they are, actually constitute our largest body of natural Middle Cornish prose, since all the other texts are in verse, except for the Trigir homilies, 
and those follow their own English originals so closely that it's hard to be sure how natural their language is. But on closer inspection, they aren't really stage directions at all in, in Buna's K, but summaries of the action, more akin to the marginal headlines that one sees in early printed books, giving a summary of the argument. It may remain convenient to refer to them as stage directions, I certainly do, but they weren't intended as such. And I wonder if the uh, comparative lack of real stage directions in Bunin's K is connected with the fact that much of it would be almost unstageable, or at any rate, extremely tedious, with the queues of dignitaries who all repeat each other's words. The numbers of actors needed and the expense of suitable costumes would make it difficult for this play to be staged by a parish. And I further wonder whether the author of Bunan's K was so carried away by his learning and his enthusiasm that what he produced was almost more an academic exercise than a play of practical use. Bunan's Meriazek is very different. In fact, we know that it was performed um, from remarks within the stage directions themselves, as Michel uh, pointed out earlier. It can be claimed as a superior work of literature compared with what we know of Bunan's K. Finally, the manuscripts themselves are very different, um, owing to the different survival of the two texts. But before I pass on to those, I want to just mention a few of the shared phrases found in both the saints' plays and not in the biblical ones, suggesting that the author of Bunan's Meriazek actually knew the text of Bunan's K, assuming that Bunan's K is the earlier one, as seems likely. The posh phrase intertextuality is sometimes used to indicate simply the inter influence of one text upon another. And I've shown you three such phrases here, a selection of a wider range that exists between the two plays, closely echoed from one text to another. So uh, when the, um, the uh, messenger in Buna's case says, Nigos Gwelan in um, the uh, apparently a rod won't sleep under feet, underfoot. Um, and the messenger in Bunan's Miriazek says exactly the same. It's been, uh, I'm sure, rightly suggested that Quillen uh, should be the word uh, replacing uh, Gwelen, a rod. Um, so a beetle won't sleep underfoot, meaning I'll go so fast on your errand. <clears throat> so that one looks as if it was a Cornish saying, although it wasn't used by similar messengers in the Ordinalia. The second is an English stock formula used by characters introducing themselves um, as is often needed at their first appearance on stage. So, Pezith uh, Ihot, Will and Tam, be silent, I command, uh, both wild and tame. I say Arthur is my name. Um, so, again, the phrase repeated from one play uh, to the other. And the third is a miracle from the Old Testament, quoted by the saint in each play, to invo invoke God's help in healing someone. It may be symptomatic that Bunan's K, the learned text uh, cites it by means of a Latin speech by the saint, whereas Bunus Meriazek has it in Cornish. Uh, so uh, the, the miracle is, is an Old Testament one of how Naaman, uh, the captain of the host of the king of Syria, was uh, healed by bathing, healed of leprosy by bathing in the river Jordan. And in each case, the saint invokes that miracle to get somebody cured within the action. Now to the manuscripts themselves. The exhibition will have given you an opportunity to see how different they are. Although Bunant's K is probably the earlier play, its manuscript is certainly later in date by about 60 or more years. The manuscript of Bunant's Meriazek is thoroughly medieval in character, while that of Bunant's K is just as thoroughly early modern. Um, I'd urge you, if you haven't already, to go upstairs and look at the differences. Um, the Meriazek one is akin to that of Ordinalia in size, in appearance, in general layout of the page, and so on. While the K manuscript is similar to that of Creation, written in 1611, in one way it would be interesting to swap round one from each case and have the two early modern ones side by side and the two medieval ones side by side. I think, but having them uh, as they are, you can see the differences anyway. The difference is partly that Bunitz Meriazek is seemingly the original, perhaps the author's original, although once again, we don't know the status of the Richard Tone who tells us that he wrote it in 1504. 
whether he was author or copyist. The other big difference is that the manuscript of Bunitz K is very incomplete. And even the original that our scribe was copying in the later 17th century was already itself incomplete. He complains that four pages have been lost or something like that. So there have been losses at two stages in its textual history, uh, which has given us the play as it now is. Several points follow from these basic differences. One is the absence of stage diagrams in Bunin's K, whereas Bunin's Meriazek has two, one of them on display, one for each day of playing, as we've seen in Michel's slides as well. Whether our manuscript of Bunin's K would have such diagrams if it were complete is an open question, just as we don't know how many days it would have needed for performance, whether two like Bunin's Meriazek or three like the Ordinalia. My own opinion is that the copyist might well not have included diagrams, just as the copyist of creation didn't either, a few years later. The scribe of Bunus K was preserving a text rather than a working copy, and practical performance would have been out of the question at the time when he was working during Queen Elizabeth's reign. We might even doubt whether Bunus K ever had stage diagrams, since parts of it seems so much like an academic exercise, unlike Bunus Meriazek. And in most parts, um, Bunus K savors of the library rather than of the stage, as Bunus Meriazek does. Although uh, the comic scene between St. K and Tudor having a bath clearly does have potential, and I know it has actually been staged in Australia. Um, I wonder whether, in fact, it's the Arthurian bits that are the more learned library bits, and the earlier bits concerned with K are the more um, practical, sta uh, stageable bits of that play. The other difference that follows is that Buna's K contains many copying errors in its text, whereas Buna's Mirazek is largely free of them. Indeed, one sometimes one wonders whether the scribe of Buna's K actually understood his text at all, so blatant are some of his errors although I'm sure that actually he did understand it, but was just a very poor copyist, whether because he was in a great hurry, or perhaps he was dyslexic, or perhaps he had some other difficulty that he was working under. We don't know whether his already damaged exemplar was itself perhaps a copy, or an original such as Bunin's Meriazek may well be. One last point about the manuscript to mention, but an important one, is that the first five leaves of the Meriazek manuscript are also a copy, like all of Bunin's K. I think it was Morton Nance who first realized that they were written in a different hand, and they also supply, supp uh, display the late Cornish sound change of double N to DN, as in um, pen, later pedden, which occurred in about the 1540s, whereas the main manuscript of Meriazek is dated 1504 and never shows that change as Bunas K doesn't either. So these first five leaves are certainly later in date. Again, it's intriguing to wonder why these pages were copied. Presumably, the opening pages of the original had become damaged, as can often happen, so somebody decided to preserve their text. But again, there can have been little hope of it actually being performed when that was done, unless it was during the 1550s in Queen Mary's reign. This time, the stage directions were included, as in creation, which adds to the thought that Bunin's K may not actually have had much in the way of stage directions. Most excitingly, though, David Thomas tells me that he thinks he can identify the scribe of these five pages as a known local Camborne man who was active in the middle of the 16th century at just the right time for when these pages appear to have been written on the internal evidence. So um, th that uh, indicates that, that the preservation and continued interest in this text was still there in Camborne Parish, um, uh, uh, probably as late as the 1550s or thereabouts. My final topic is one that I've mentioned already, various features within the text of Bunin's K that I think point towards Welsh influence in it, suggesting that the author was either a Cornish speaker who had spent time in Wales, or a Welsh speaker who had come to Cornwall and learned Cornish. There are documented examples of interchange in personnel between clerics of Glasney College and South Wales, 
so it wouldn't be at all exceptional for something of that kind to have happened. The feature that first made me think about this is the very obvious one of the use of two names from Welsh literature as part of the Arthurian story. Arthur being said to be a Gilliweek of Cassiweeg, although his residence and court in the play are at Caerleon on Usk, which is Geoffrey of Monmouth's location for them. So they, they put him at Geoffrey of Monmouth's uh, place, but they say he's of this other place, which uh, appears in Welsh literature. And second, uh, the name of his sword, Calesvol, in the Cornish text, is a simple modification into Cornish of its name in Welsh literature, Caledvulch, or hard notch. From what we know of Cornish folklore about Arthur, it's highly unlikely that these names would have existed in Cornish oral tradition to be drawn on by the author of Bunant's K. And from what we know of Cornish literature, it's even more unlikely that there were written texts about Arthur specifically, which might have mentioned these places independently of their appearance in Welsh literature. So overall, much the likeliest explanation for these names is that they were taken from some Welsh literary source where they appeared. In this context, I've noticed one minor feature of the phonology that looks Welsh, which is the treatment of the verb veru dies as a monosyllable in Bunan's K, whereas it was normally treated as a disyllable in the Ordinalia, as Ben Bruch has pointed out. It's remained a monosyllable in Welsh, like the rhyme word caru, stag, and it appears once as a monosyllable in the Ordinalia, and in its two occurrences in Bunan's Meriasek as well. But those are all places where it occurs before a vowel, and one can understand it being shortened in that context. Whereas in Bunan's K, it's a monosyllable in consonantal contexts as well as vocalic ones. I also wonder whether the spelling of this word in Bunan's K is significant, with the epithetic vowel spelt Welsh style with E, echoing the vowel of the primary syllable, instead of the normal spelling in the ordinalia, which was with O, as it also in its rhyme word, caro, a stag. There are also one or two grammatical features which have a slightly Welsh look. I've mentioned the greater use of the R passive, um, although its numerical high score is partly because of its appearance in some repeated passages. Another possible feature is that I think the use of predicative in before an adjective is more frequent in Bunan's K than in the other Cornish texts. Its use in phrases such as Galsavin fall, I have gone mad, and Galsavin clave, I have become ill, is not very typical of Cornish usage elsewhere. But at present, that's only a subjective impression. But the most important Welsh-looking feature of Bunan's K is some of the vocabulary. Specifically, various words which are unique here within the corpus of Cornish, although the limited nature of that corpus means that our knowledge of the language is incomplete, and most importantly, which don't occur at all in Breton, but are well attested in Welsh. Several of these words are of a learned type, which would fit in with what else we know of the author of Bunan's K. Those include the technical term galanas, a blood feud or murder, the word Pridith, poet, which suspiciously has its Welsh form here, not its expected Cornish form, Presith. And the word Eglinion or Eglinio stands as verses, which appears twice with different plural endings in Bunan's K. And again suspiciously, in one of its two occurrences, it has the Welsh plural ending Yon, which in Cornish was elsewhere used only for groups of people, not for inanimate objects or abstract ideas. So the use of that ending gives this word, itself known only in Welsh otherwise, a particularly Welsh appearance. Two of these words relate to poetry and one to law, areas of importance in medieval Welsh learned circles. Because these words don't appear elsewhere in the remains of Cornish, um, their precise meaning is not always clear in the text and their meanings in Welsh are the only guide that we have to their meaning in Bunan's K. Several of these features which I'm suggesting as Welsh looking might be inconclusive in themselves, especially perhaps the grammatical ones, but cumulatively I think that they point clearly to an author who had more than a passing acquaintance with Welsh language and culture. 
So that brings me to the end of my rapid sur survey showing us how, how much there is to get out of these plays. I've only skated across the surface, as you would have seen. I'm sure I speak for everyone near and far in saying how grateful we all are to the National Library of Wales and to the Bodleian Library for the opportunity to see all these manuscripts together in one place and to Deborah Tritton and Chloe um, and her colleagues for their hard work in making this exhibition happen. Thank you very much.